If variety is the spice of life, Lainsois Madanensis is a dish that hits every taste bud. What's up guys? Welcome to the Cuba Kitchen Journey. And as many of you know, my wife is from Brazil and that means that every once in a while we get to go there. But unlike almost every other trip we've taken there, this time we actually got to go on a vacation, which was wonderful. We spent two weeks in Brazil. A week of that we spent in the National Park of Lençóis Maranhenses, which is a beautiful place in the northeastern part of Brazil. Uh, this was actually my first time having a real vacation in Brazil and I had requested, I had one request, I want to see the rainforest. And Anna said no. Uh, the conversation went something like that. She's laughing off camera right now. Um, but I am super satisfied with where we went. So you can imagine the shock when I learned that we were going to see a desert. I mean, how much more different from a rainforest can you get than a factual, actual, literal desert? But that's exactly where we went. Now, let's be honest. Uh, who wants to visit a desert in the first place? I mean, when someone thinks of Brazil, who thinks, let's go look at sand? <laughs> But I gotta be honest, this was truly one of the most beautiful places I have ever visited, if not the most beautiful place that I have ever visited. Uh, I don't actually own a drone, so this footage I actually borrowed. Uh, you can check out the link in the description and you can go see the original footage there. Um, but this gives you an idea of the kind of place that we were at. And in all actuality, it wasn't a desert at all. Uh, Linsois Manarensis National Park, it covers an area of about 600 square miles, which is roughly the size of Sao Paulo. If you don't know how Sa big Sao Paulo is, it's roughly 600 square miles miles. <laughs> and this place, it's littered with thousands of freshwater pools. Uh, during the rainy season, these pools will actually fill up continuously, providing fresh water for people that have livestock and live inside of the national park. And there are people that live in this remote wilderness. And when I say remote, I mean completely remote. This is pretty cut off from the outside world. They do have electricity, which is uh, great, but you'll be driving through and you'll just see like cows and things, uh, stuff scattered around the desert. There's really only three ways that you can reach the these dunes. Uh, one of these ways is the ocean. This can bring you to the east side of the park. Uh, we did visit the ocean while we were there. Um, the river can run you up uh, from the city and get you to the ocean. Now the dunes, where we went in the ocean and the dunes were, they were very different. Even the types of sand were different at the ocean as they were in the uh, interior. Um, the two areas Anna and I are pointing to in this picture uh, are where we got to over road. And I use the word road loosely. When I say road, what I really mean is there was a patch of ground in which trees did not, for the most part, <laughs> exist. Um, and it's worth mentioning that not anybody can drive here. You can't just load up your pickup truck and go there for a couple of reasons. One, they will tell you that your vehicle will not be able to handle the roads. They're bumpy, they're sandy, they're muddy, they're watery, they're just gross. Um, they even reduce the, uh, the air pressure in their tires when they're going into these places. And also you need credentials. Uh, you need to have permission in order to take a vehicle into this place. Now I was told, I'm under the understanding that it was the locals of the national park, the people that live there. Um, not anybody can just move there or live there. You have to have a generational tie to the area. And these are the people that decide who gets credentials. And so they will give credentials to these tourist groups and the tourist groups will go into the park. And then of course there's a financial cut for everybody uh, involved. So the sign that you saw, it says you need specific authorization and the vehicles must be permitted to enter into the park. And if you really want to see what the dunes have to offer, you're going to have to book yourself a trip on the back of one of these trucks, uh, the back of these specially modified pickup trucks um, and, and prepare yourself for 40 minutes of being tossed around in a, in a paint mixer. I mean, it is just insane. The amount of bouncing and, ex and, and 
I don't even know what the word for it is. Bouncing. It's just bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and more bouncing. And to be honest, we were fortunate. On the first day, we thought the bouncing was bad. We actually had a truck with good shocks the first day. The second day was a completely different story. If you want to visit this landscape, be prepared for a turbulent ride down narrow roads through dense vegetation, isolated villages, streams, and ponds, some of which were deep enough to actually cover our headlights. So this 45 minute drive on our first day uh, led us to a, a clearing. There was a bit of an opening and then we took a walking path. And this is the first time we actually got to experience the sand that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, but as you climb the hill, you really just experience this gateway into a completely different world. Uh, behind us, you see uh, just miles as far as the eye could see of thick, dense, green vegetation. And you turn around and then you just see the endless expanse of desert and pools. Uh, perhaps this was no more uh, clear, the contracts was no more striking than when we were actually heading back to the vehicles to, uh, to go to our, our location, to go back to our hotel. And you could stand on top of the dune and just see the, the immensity of what I would describe as jungle, even though it wasn't the rainforest. What I would describe as jungle, and I gotta, I gotta be honest, pictures and video, they cannot do justice to the vastness of these disparate worlds colliding in one place. It is insane and it is beautiful. Upon our arrival, our guide informed us to take off our sandals. We actually left them in the truck. Uh, we didn't have them the entire day we were there. We wouldn't be needing them. Uh, we were actually blessed with overcast, and so in some of the shots, some of the videos, you see it's cloudy, and you might go, oh, darn, you know, it's cloudy. But that's actually uh, was really, really good. And what we were told is that even at the height of the dry season, when it's sunny and the sun is bearing down, just whatever the composition is of the sand, it still feels cool between your feet. Now, we didn't have to deal with that. Um, we didn't have to experience or test that out because it was actually cool while we were there, uh, which also means that during our time there, the sand was pretty damp from the regular rain. And when dry, these dunes are comprised of the finest sand I have ever seen, if I have ever experienced, or I've ever touched. It was crazy. And you can see Anna here, uh, the small handfuls, they just dissipate instantly when you release them. I mean, you pour it out and it just goes straight into the wind. Now, the drier sands, when you are, if you are there when it is drier, it makes for this really visual uh, appeal. Um, I've actually seen people literally take boogie boards down the hills, down the dunes, into the lakes below. And so if you ever have a chance to visit, uh, I would say you're better off coming in January when it's still rainy season, when it's cooler. But if you want to boogie board, maybe you want to go in dry season. We actually did see someone boogie boarding the second day down the hill into the water. So that was kind of cool. And our guides informed us um, that the pools, they continuously fill until about the end of January. And the cloud covers days make for a much better experience. So if you go towards the end of rainy season, you're gonna have much deeper pools. And these things get, uh, from what I read, to about 10 feet deep, which is just insane. And then they dry up in the dry season. And while we didn't slide down any of the dunes, the sands had dried enough by the second day, we saw people that were doing that. Now we opted for a little bit different method of traversing the dunes into the water. Uh, we were running down them and rolling down them. Uh, there were collisions. There was excitement. Uh, I raced my wife. I won and then promptly face planted into the water. Uh, what I discovered is there's really no good way to enter the water. Every time that I went down the hill, I was coughing water, I was swallowing water, I was getting sand in my ears. I'm convinced I'd probably still be getting sand out of my ears. It was everywhere, but it was awesome. Uh, just be prepared to be washing out copious amounts of sand from every nook and cranny of your body. Uh, I would also advise keeping your eyes on the water and remembering to take a breath before you get into the water. I think that was my primary mistake as I was trying to breathe after I had already hit the water. And fun fact, human can't breathe in water. So uh, Peter and Paul actually got in on this action as well. Um, they weren't quite as venturous as say Kaiki who was doing somersaults in the air over the cliffs. Um, but Paul must have traversed the dunes a dozen times just walking up to the top and then hopping his way down, which was super cool to see that my kids aren't afraid of heights. We'll see how that plays out in the future. Uh, our first day tour was supposed to end with a sunset. 
Unfortunately, this is the one downside of going during rainy season. The chances of you catching like that sunset with the orange sky and the sand is, is, is pretty low, and that was the case for us. We didn't get to see uh, the sunset that night. In fact, on the drive back, it poured. Uh, it rained and it rained and rained, but throughout our entire trip, the only time it rained is when it really didn't affect our good time, which was a huge blessing to us. So that is kind of what it was like while we were there um, in that first day. Uh, the trips to the dunes, they begin with a ferry crossing. That picture I showed you of Anna and I pointing at a billboard, that was on our way there. On the way back, you cross that same ferry, and before you get to the river, you're gonna find uh, a bunch of local shops and souvenirs, and here's what I wanna request for you. If you go to this park, if you go anywhere in Brazil, especially these small villages, hit the local shops for souvenirs. At the time of this recording, the economy in Brazil is like, awful. It's it's not good, but what that means is that your American dollar has really, really good buying power. Um, right now, the U.S. dollar is fetching about six hay eyes. In our first day, we picked up uh, a couple of these little glasses, um, little jars that have sand from Mensois Mariense, and um, I'm going to put a video of how they make this uh, right here. And this is a pretty tedious process, and if you were to go and find something like this uh, in the United States, you would be paying probably 20 to $50 easily, easily for something like this. Um, here, we got this smaller one here. Um, I think Anna said we paid like four hay eyes, four or five hay eyes, which is a dollar or less than a dollar. Less than a dollar uh, for this. I'm going to try to, there we go. Um, and there you can see the design and uh, all the work that went into that and that you're getting for less than a dollar supporting the local economy. So definitely make sure that you uh, take in the time to do that. We also have the bigger one here that uh, cost us 10 hayes, about 10 hayes, which is again, a couple bucks for a really cool uh, souvenir that you can take with you, something better than you're getting at Disney World and a heck of a lot cheaper. Uh, we also visited a nearby ocean a few days later. Um, they called that one the city. And so we went to, it was this cute little town. Um, there was a military base there and they had a shop that had seashells. They had done art with seashells. And again, those were all very reasonably priced as well. Uh, I just opted at that location to buy ice cream instead because I like ice cream. But if you go there, if you make it to this beautiful part of the world, be sure to penny up and support the locals. Spend a couple bucks. It's not going to hurt, and it's going to be uh, very helpful to them. Uh, our second day of travel, again, looked very much like the first day. We were going down the road on these very bumpy uh, roads through thick vegetation in small villages uh, and across some very deep streams. The second day, we went through basically rivers, which was kind of cool. Um, and once we passed the vegetation, our driver was informed that our group in enjoyed a bit of excitement in life, okay? And so uh, they kind of have these set roads that most of the cars go on, but then you see like these tall dunes that have like two or three tracks on them. And my sister-in-law is like, let's go up that. And so uh, after our first stop, our driver knew we liked a good time. And so we were speeding up and down, driving through these dunes at about 100 kilometers per hour, 60 miles per hour, which doesn't sound fast when you're on the interstate. It's pretty stinking fast when you're uh, driving on dunes, and it was a thrill ride, not for the faint of heart or for good for butt bones, but the ride and the destinations were worth any soreness whatsoever. Um, that said, I was grateful. On our third day, we switched to a boat, and the boat was a very smooth ride to where we were going. Uh, the smooth river ride was a welcome replacement of the bouncy benches in the back of the pickup. The Preguisas River flowed from our hotel in Bajerinas, uh, and the daily boat tours uh carry visitors to the to a variety of locale, locales. They pick them up. Um, we got picked up in the truck, drove like three minutes to the boat dock, and then we would go to these different locations on the river. Our first stop took us to a riverside restaurant where we would enjoy lunch. Uh, it was actually really cool. We got there early. Our, our tour guide found out that we liked to get out early, and so he's like, great, I can get you out before all my other crews. And so we got there, and there was no one in the restaurant yet, and the owner of the restaurant was like, okay, just let us know how many you have and what you want to eat. So when you come back at noon, I'll have lunch for you. And we said fish 
because I ate fish everywhere because I'm at the ocean in Brazil and on rivers in Brazil and I wanted fish. And so he said, okay, great. And I was walking away and I looked down to the river and I just saw the guy carrying up a giant fish by the tail. And I was like, there's my lunch, which was really cool. You know, you were getting some pretty fresh fish. And so our, our first stop, we stopped at the restaurant and then we were about two minute walk over a sand dune. It led us to the ocean where our, our family relaxed. We swam, collected seashells for about an hour. If you've ever uh, been to the ocean or if you've ever experienced the ocean, um, it was, it was pretty typical of the ocean. Uh, my wife has an obsession with the ocean. She loves it. And so that's what we did for about an hour. Okay, after our lunch break, it was back in the boat to visit uh, the small town I talked about earlier that had the seashell art. That was on our second day. Um, it was adjacent to a military base. So did you know Brazil has a military? <laughs> Apparently they do. Um, and if you're not afraid of heights, definitely take some time to climb the massive lighthouse uh, that is on this military base. Um, our tour guide informed us to go straight from the boat to the lighthouse because it's first come first serve and by the time we were coming down the lighthouse there was a line forming and so we were able to get that um, experience out of the way early which means I could get down the lighthouse and have time to buy my ice cream because I like ice cream. Come on, I've established this already. Uh, and again, when you're there, be sure to make some purchases uh, in the local town. After that, we had one more spot we needed to go after we went back and got my brother-in-law's phone charger that was left at the restaurant. But after that, we had one more place to go, um, and it was at this Riverside rest area. This is probably the most touristy spot we were at. There was a restaurant there too, we didn't eat there, and they had, uh, trinkets and stuff that very much look like they were made in China. Um, some of the stuff was looked authentic to the region and some of it was just looked like they brought in some Chinese stuff to fill their gift shop. We didn't buy anything there, um, but we did get to see some of the wild monkeys. I, I guess I'll call them wild. Uh, they were actually very tame. In fact, one of the biggest shocks in my first trip to Brazil seven years ago was a notable lack of wildlife. I mean, when, when I think Brazil, when you think Brazil, you probably think like rainforest, biggest ecosystem in the world, like animals everywhere. And I learned that part of this is simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, there's rainy season, there's dry season, animals migrate, and there's patterns that I don't understand because I'm not smart enough to. Um, but many of the regions also suffer from a lack of enforced hunting and fishing regulations. That doesn't mean they don't have them. It just means that people are hungry. And if they see something they can eat and they're starving, they're going to shoot it and they're going to eat it. And so that happens in a lot of places. So in my trips to Brazil, I actually haven't seen a ton of wildlife. But in this trip, I got to see some of these cool wild monkeys. Wild. Uh, okay, they were far from wild, but they were a great treat for the boys. Uh, with that stop done, we, we headed back to the river. We headed back to our hotel. Our final day of our vacation was a float trip down a peaceful river. I actually heard that Anna's dad is the one who chose this. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of footage as our primary phone in this instance fell into the river. Um, but after the bouncy rides and the adrenaline filled car rides and ocean swimming, a, a peaceful float trip was the perfect cap to a week um, in this wonderful, beautiful part of Brazil. Uh, if you ever find yourself craving something a little different for your vacation, uh, especially now, I will say the travel restrictions are difficult in this era of COVID. Um, getting there was difficult for us. We had to drive an hour away to get tested uh, in time in order to get to get on our flight to Brazil and getting home was a headache as flights were getting canceled everywhere. Um, but if you find it in your in your heart that you're craving something a little bit different, the truth is Brazil is not an expensive place to travel to compared to a lot of places in the world. Uh, as of last year or two years ago, you don't need a visa in order to travel there. And so as long as you have a passport, you can travel to Brazil. Um, the strength of the dollar makes it affordable and the beauty of it makes it even all the more worth it. Hey, I know this video was a little bit different, but I couldn't help. I wanted to share a little bit of what our experience was. You caught the videos that we recorded while we were in Brazil. Uh, though, If you didn't catch them, you can look at the fruits of Brazil. Make sure you click the link at the end of this video. Um, and we also recorded another video in Anna's backyard, uh, Anna's parents' backyard, if you wanna check that out. I do hope you consider subscribing to our channel. If you like content like we normally do, uh, make sure you subscribe. If you like content, 
content like this, you can subscribe too, but this is definitely a change of pace for us. Hey, we love you guys. Thank you for tuning in and sharing with us our Brazil experience, and we will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.